Metallica rose from garage band to global stadium phenomenon on their own terms. By the time they began making radio singles and music videos, they had already carved out a powerful place in heavy metal history. They were playing arenas before MTV even heard of them. Radio was nowhere, you know, MTV, definitely, big no-no. No one would help us, so we played live, we played till we dropped. Metallica's music is laden with hard-hitting images of adolescent rage, suicide, drug addiction, mental illness, and political violence. Their lyrics take on taboos set to the spirit of pure rock and roll rebellion. A battery works off positive and negative, you know? So uh, we were very good at the negative stuff. <laughs> James Hetfield was born in Downey, California in 1963, and raised in a strict Christian science family broken by divorce. When James was a teenager, cancer claimed his mother's life. Doctors and hospitals are kind of like taboo, and with the help of God, you will get better. You know, you're kind of going with it, but you feel it's not quite right, and you're at school, and okay, now it's time for health class, and I have to get up and leave. You know, learning about the body wasn't necessary. This is a shell, and what's true is your soul, and all this. So actually leaving class, and then getting, you know, all the little kids. So that was the beginning of alienation, I believe, as a child. Back then, James was like the most introverted person you've ever seen. He didn't really talk. Anytime you'd see him, he'd just, hey, how's it going? Pick up his guitar and just start jamming away, you know? In 1963, on the other side of the globe, Lars Ulrich was born to a prominent Danish tennis pro. For a time, he was groomed to follow in his father's footsteps. The thing was that in Denmark, um, I was somebody, you know, ranked sort of somewhere in the top tens in my junior years and so on. When I came to the States in like 1980, I was basically like, I mean, I wasn't even ranked in the top ten on the block I lived on. In the beginning, he was sort of kind of an air guitar guy, you know, and going completely, uh, you know, crazy with his broomstick or whatever, or a kind of a racket, you know. Of course, a tennis racket can also be sort of an air guitar, right? Drums had been the kind of hobby away from tennis, and at the tail end of, of 1979, there was what was called the new wave of British heavy metal. Iron Maiden, Death Leopard, Motorhead, Saxon, Tigers of Pantang, Diamond Head, Angel Witch, you know, the list goes on. It was the attitude. The attitude came from Motorhead. Rock and roll was supposed to bring you crazed joy and rebellion for no apparent reason, for its own sake, right? That's what we started out as music to fish your parents off of. James and Lars met in Los Angeles in 1981, drawn together by fate, and the musicians wanted ads in a local paper. You know, under heavy metal, there were two guys, and it was me and him. <laughs> Lars had this drum kit. It was ten different colors, one cymbal. He hit it, it kept falling over. Finally, he sits down, and he's just like... I'm going, you sure this guy played drums before? What Lars may have lacked musically, he more than made up for with his personal connections in the heavy metal scene. Lars had a friend who was producing a compilation album featuring local metal bands. Lars called me up and said, uh, hey, if I put together a band, can I be on your compilation album? I said, yeah, absolutely, no problem. Lars had really had a spot on the record, but no band. So, hmm, in my kind of will and maybe greediness to get going in this thing, said, okay, uh, we'll hook up. The band had a spot reserved on an upcoming album. Soon they had a second guitarist, Dave Mustaine. I went in there and I set up my gear. I started warming up and these guys were all in the other room. I walked in there and I said, uh, come on, let's go. And they said, you got the job. And I went, that was easy. In 1981, Metallica's frenetic two guitar sound was a direct assault on LA's softcore glam rock scene. We weren't doing what they were doing. They were playing pretty much cheeky music because they wanted the girls, and all we wanted to do was rule the world. If you came here to see spandex and big hair, this ain't your band, and that was kind of became our war cry, you know? Metallica met with an apathetic response in the L.A. clubs, which only served to fuel their aggressive play. That developed our style. We were up on stage. We wanted attention. We're going to play louder. We're going to play faster. <laughs> In the winter of 1981, a benefit for Metal Mania magazine brought the band to San Francisco. The city was a hotbed for the new heavy metal movement. 
everybody just wanted to make the, the most obnoxious, loudest, scary parents, annoy people, um, fastest music you could. That heavy crunch, crunch stuff was, was way new, and everybody loved it, you know? It, it tickles your, your same kind of funny bone that makes you break windows when you're a kid. One of those Bay Area fans was Exodus guitarist Kirk Hammond. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It, it was the most original, heaviest, fastest thing I had ever seen in my life. By the time Metallica returned to Los Angeles, tensions within the band were building. Dave Mustaine's drinking was getting out of hand. But there was always some clashing between Ron and Dave. Ron couldn't hang. He uh, didn't want to be a part of it anymore. Ron was soon out, and Metallica was in the market for a new bassist. Lars had asked me, they were kind of looking around for another bass player, and he asked me if I knew anybody. I said, well, why don't you guys come down and see this band Trom at the Troubadour? They're pretty cool. I think you might like the bass player. When I first saw Cliff Burton, I'd never seen anybody quite like him on stage. And his head banging on stage, I mean, nobody banged like him. It was insane. I remember the first time I saw them play with him, I was like, oh my God, look at that guy. The next day after a performance, he'd, he'd get up and, oh God, my neck, I can't understand. <laughs> Cliff, what do you mean? <laughs> your neck, you're bouncing your head up and down all night long and wonder why your neck hurts. So. Uh, but anyway, he kind of smiled. You know, after six months of courting him, it, it just came to, to the point where he would join the band on that one condition, which was if we wanted him in the band, the talent goes to Northern California. L.A. sucks! We really had no problem with that. L.A. wasn't treating us very well at all. Metallica moved to San Francisco in the spring of 1983 and rented a small house in El Cerrito. These were lean times for the band, but they had found a home for their unique brand of metal. We'd just move all the furniture out of the house and invite 50 headbanging friends over, put venom on the stereo, and just thrash the place, you know? By the time we walk in the club, we'd just be like, Metal rules! That guy's got a blonde stripe in his hair. Kill him. Kiss that Motley Crew creep. There was kids with denim jackets on that had Metallica patches on the back, and the support band was playing, and they, they turned around, they turned their backs on them, and we're standing there doing this, you know? And it's like, wow, they're loyal to us. They're our people, you know? In 1983, Metallica had moved to San Francisco to join forces with eccentric bass genius Cliff Burton. When Lars circulated Metallica's seven-song demo, No Life Till Leather, the band became an underground sensation. That they had this huge, giant following before they even really had a record out. <laughs> Metallica's demo wound up in the hands of Johnny and Marsha Zazula, who ran a music flea market in New Jersey called Rock and Roll Heaven. It was the East Coast capital of the growing metal movement. Metallica was the answer to America's prayers. They were the first band we heard that really made America look they gave good. They gave the American hang, headbang or something to hang their hat on. Johnny Z offered to manage Metallica and to secure them a recording deal. So we come out to New York and we meet this guy who was giving us, you know, $75 to drive across the country. It's like, hi, we're Metallica. Hi, I'm Johnny Z. Well, John, come here. Well, you see the guy with a day of stain? Um, we're actually going to get rid of him next week. Whoa. And we all got up early one morning and uh, walked into the other room where Dave was sleeping. And Shake, shake, shake. Dave wakes up and rolls over. And going on guys i look up and i see the four of them and they said you're out of the band and i said what no warning no second chance the famous line dave you're out of the band uh you know well you know when's my plane leave uh <laughs> well, you're spending the next four days on a greyhound bus that leaves in 45 minutes to pack your shit together and let's go to the bus station before you even know what hit you and that was that <laughs> No sooner had Dave Mustaine boarded a bus than Kirk Hammett arrived in New York to audition for the band. The first song we played was Seek and Destroy, and Kirk pulled off this solo. It was like, things are going to be all right, man. And we went to the studio and recorded Kill Em All. From then on, I thought, well, I guess I'm in the band. We parlayed everything we had to, to make this Kill Em All record. We thought this was an amazing record. It was a classic. We have a debut album out on Megaforce Records. The international metal underground was primed for Metallica's first album, Kill 'Em All, and sales soared to over 300,000. The band toured Europe and America for most of 1983, supporting the album and widening their audience. It 
lived it, they breathed it, they slept it. Metal. And the kids did the same exact thing. We were very proud that we were four regular guys in street clothes getting up there and jamming. Now why should we change? We're on stage. And we're not trying to be something big and fancy, you know. It's just us doing what we do. Let's keep it that way. In 1984, the new American metal scene had found a champion in Metallica. When the band's second album, Ride the Lightning, was picked up by Elektra Records, it quickly went gold. Because of the buzz that they'd created live, it just worked out perfectly for Elektra. So it was one of those things that felt like a no-brainer. Just We put out the record, and because of word of mouth, kids just started buying it. On the road, Metallica's unabashed love of alcohol became the stuff of legend. So much so, the press took to calling them... Alcoholica. Alcoholica. <laughs> Alcoholica justified absolutely. It basically grew out of our love for vodka. They were never a drug band. They were never, you know, like the American bands all want to get high. They like to drink. We had discovered this lovely after-dinner drink called Jägermeister. There was a certain opiate in it that got you extremely violent. <laughs> Dude, had people, like, literally walking into walls, taking their clothes off. I mean, this stuff was lethal. Standing up on the bar, taking a piss, whatever, you know, getting your nuts out at a restaurant. I guess this is sort of like a East Bay attitude, you know, crush, kill, destroy, smash. You know, whatever the bill was, it was all worth it. It's all rock and roll it's all being on tour their rough and tumble touring life did nothing to slow metallica down and in the spring of 1986 the band released its third album master of puppets it sold a million copies without the benefit of a radio single or music video metallica toured for six months with ozzy osbourne it would be their last as a supporting act. They really give me a run for my money every night. The crowd were going nuts for them, you know, stealing the show most of the night. They were really hard to follow. On tour, Metallica indulged in classic rock and roll excess. And when you're 22 years old and all you want to do is get laid and get drunk and live all those excesses that you hear about or read about, and all of a sudden they're right in front of you. We'd come right off stage into the showers and there'd be you know, a whole locker room shower filled with women. I mean, how great is that? That happened. Plenty. Tub tarts. Shower. Eight women washing you down at once, you know? Not a bad feeling. But Metallica's wild ride would soon come crashing to a halt. On September 27, 1986, the band was traveling by bus on the road between Stockholm and Copenhagen. Earlier that night, a friendly dispute between Kirk and Cliff over sleeping arrangements concluded with a draw of cards. The first card that Cliff picked was the Ace of Spades, and he looked at me and said, I want your bunk. And I said, fine, take my bunk, I'll sleep up front. That's probably better anyway. You know, <laughs> later on that night, at about five or six in the morning, I heard a skidding, I heard a vibration, and then this, this motion. I thought we were going off a cliff. He overcorrected to get back onto the road, and as he did, the back end came around this way, and it started chomp, chomp, chomp. It's the sound of screeching brakes and uh, being flipped around like a piece of clothes in a dryer. Just got woke up, like hot coffee get poured all over me, you know, from the, the coffee machine and, you know, the bus was on its side. And I heard everyone screaming except for Cliff. And I thought, oh my God, something's wrong. Seeing the bus driver just, you know, freaking frantic. And I turned around and I saw Cliff's legs sticking out from underneath the bus. I went to, you know, pull him out, wake him up or whatever. It's like. You know, he's not moving. He just got thrown out the window and boom, the bus landed on him. And basically, by all accounts, I mean, he never woke up. Early Saturday morning, September 27th, 1986, on the road near Jungby, Sweden, Cliff Burton died. Within hours, news of Cliff's death reached Metallica's fans in America. One such fan was Flotsam and Jetsam bassist Jason Newstead. I remember tears hitting the newspaper. Killed in Sweden, Metallica bassist Cliff Burton, 24 years old or whatever, and I'm just, just lost it. Lars, James, and Kirk returned to San Francisco to attend the funeral of their friend and bandmate. Lars took over from then on, and, you know, in all fairness to Lars, without Lars Ulrich, that band wouldn't be where they are today.
With the added pressure of a Japanese tour scheduled to begin within a month, the band auditioned 40 prospective bassists in San Francisco. I can remember those, those auditions just being really, really bad because we were drinking throughout the whole thing. We were still grieving, obviously. We tried out quite a few people. Uh, Les Claypool from Primus was actually one of them. Lars was all, you're not used to playing this kind of music, are you? And I was like, no, hey, you know, you guys want to jam on some Isley Brothers tunes? You know, and uh, nobody, nobody laughed at my joke. He was too good. He was like, okay, you got your own thing, you know. They never called me, and I weeped. Weeped, weeped like, a, like, a, like a little girl. Well, a guy would come in that just didn't look right or whatever, plug the bass in for 20 seconds, do, 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 next. I mean, it was cold. And I'm just going whole, I was shaking in my boots. Jason, we thought, was the man. Kind of the punter vibe, but he had the energy that we were looking for. We sat down and we decided he's going to be the guy, so we took him to this place, Tommy's Joint in San Francisco, where we kind of like to hang, and took him out to grub, and Lars and I went in the bathroom to piss together. It's like, let's go tell him now, okay? Lars comes out, do you want a job? And I go, nah, I guess. And he goes, okay, you're going to be a bass roadie. And I'm like, F her, you know? <laughs> and he goes, no, you got it, man. You're in. You want to play with us? And I'm like, Shah. Jason's jumping off the table and doing backflips and all this stuff. It's like... Okay, all right, man, you know. Um, but soon after that was the, the hazing. We gave him a pretty tough time because we, we didn't want him to think that he just, like, waltzed into a perfect situation, you know. You know I hate to say this, but Jason became the scapegoat for, for, you know, the tragic loss that we had just experienced with Cliff. With the specter of Cliff Burton's death hanging over the band, they embarked for Japan in the fall of 1986. But for Metallica and their new bass player, the transition was a hard one. We were all trying to see his, his boiling point, you know, or how much he can take, you know. Loving him means that, that he has to accept us for who we are, which is not easy. I mean, everyone thinks, wow, this guy's landed the greatest gig, etc. On the one hand, yes, but on the other hand, think of all the baggage that he's got to plow through, plus he's got those three. Still mourning the loss of Cliff Burton, Metallica found an outlet for their anger and rage in the recording studio. Their album, And Justice For All, was a progressive, frenzied and violent album that pronounced the death of the American dream and found immediate favor with heavy metal fans. They'll leave a venue like at 4 o'clock in the morning and there's kids still waiting out there. It doesn't make a difference how tired they are. They'll talk to every single one, sign every single piece of paper. They're incredibly gracious and generous and their fans know it and appreciate it. We're just four lucky fans that got together and started playing. This could be you. In October of 1990, Metallica entered the studio to record their fifth album with producer Bob Rock. So I saw them live, and I was very surprised to see how powerful they were. He came to us and said, look, you haven't captured what you're capable of on a record yet. So I just wanted them to sound better. And basically, by sounding better, hopefully the audience would get bigger and, and more people could get into Metallica. The recording process took over 10 months and cost over a million dollars. The grueling sessions were plagued by creative differences and personal conflicts. <laughs> Throughout the whole recording, we were so, so anal about everything, so protected about everything, so guarded about everything that it created a lot of tension. We forgot why we were there, to create and play music. By the time the album was finished, three out of four of us were divorced. But by surviving the creative turmoil, Metallica emerged a stronger, better band. In August of 1991, they released their self-titled fifth album. The controversial cover reinforced the no rules but Metallica rules ethic. Black sleeve, black logo, no explanations. We've got a bone to pick with these two. You know, it's called Black Album. It's called Black Album. Now, where did the idea come from to do an all black album, Metallica representatives? <laughs> the Black Album entered Billboard at number one and went double platinum in less than two weeks. It went on to sell 18 million copies worldwide and helped draw a mainstream audience to uncompromising heavy metal. Metallica toured relentlessly for the next two and a half years, playing more than 300 dates worldwide. Obviously, they're known for touring and touring and touring and touring. And in this kind of music, they, they proved to be the ultimate road dogs. 
Since day one, that's how we got our fan base. We got to love playing live. And touring was our thing. The band stopped in Moscow to perform for a crowd of over a half million Russian rock and roll fans. Russian boys running up, hugging you, going, we love Metallica, you know. We've been waiting our whole lives, and the energy that we got from them was just so amazing. But in the turbulent wake of Perestroika, the enthusiasm of the crowd clashed with the Russian military authorities. Violence erupted. It's all military, beating kids down, just whacking them. They don't know, they don't understand what a release is at a show. They don't know what's going on here. During the show, the band was unaware of the mayhem. When the music stopped, Metallica was shocked to learn about the brutality that raged while they played. I believe there was like 200 rapes, 11 deaths. Uh, people just beat into a pulp. In the spring of 1992, a summer tour was planned featuring Metallica with Guns N' Roses. We wanted to get the two biggest bands together on one bill and do a stadium tour across America. I'd always had an infatuation with Guns N' Roses. Always had an infatuation with bands that are unpredictable and dangerous. The tour was plagued with cancellations and last minute changes due to the recurring throat problems of Guns N' Roses singer Axl Rose. Then on August 8, 1992, the two bands were performing at Montreal's Olympic Stadium when a double dose of disaster struck. During Fade to Black, I'm up there playing the part and these colored flames are going off. I'm a little confused on where I should be. I walk forward, I walk back. We have these flashes of magnesium that burns at 1,200 degrees, 1,800 degrees, who knows, but hot enough to melt metal. The pyro guy doesn't see me that I've walked back out there. A big colored flame goes right up under me, uh, and instantly I you know, squint and turn. James Hetfield looks like uh, that torch that they carry up the stairs to light the Olympic fire. So I'm burnt, all my arm, my hand completely down to the bone, the side of my face, hair gone, uh, part of my back. I said, you all right, man? He looked at me and he, he was shaking and he brought up his, his hand. And I could literally see the skin rising off his, his hand and blister. We see some guy come up and dump him with water and then cover him. Well, that felt oh, great for a second. Then I looked down and watched the skin just rising and things going wrong. Total confusion and adding to the mix, you know, 50,000 people. Lars took the stage to calm the disturbed and agitated crowd. There was an incident with uh, the pyrotechnics. Unfortunately, James uh, is on his way to the hospital right now and we're very sorry, but we can't continue the concert for you guys tonight. We will come back and finish our concert and play again for you as soon as we can within the next couple of months. Thank you, Montreal. We're sorry, okay? This is pain I've never felt in my whole life. This, and it won't go away. I'm freaking at this point, you know. Anxiety, you know. Uh, we got to get moving. We got him into a ER. The doctors and nurses, they were great. They, they, they cut off his rings. His fingers were swelling. It was not a pretty sight. It was with the pain he was still going through and the unknown future that this was pointing the way to. One of his first thoughts was getting a replacement guitar guy to make sure the tour didn't have to stop. James had sustained second and third degree burns to his left hand and both arms. He had stepped into a 12 foot high, 3200 degree tower of flame and survived. His future with the band was uncertain at best. Meanwhile, back at Olympic Stadium, a tense crowd waited for Guns N' Roses to perform. Guns N' Roses could have come out and saved the day by going on playing a three-hour blistering set. He could have been the hero of the day, you know. We continue the show and, you know, the band plays on and we're here to bring music and he throws his fit. Axel's monitor system wasn't to his liking. Then the storm two of the evening kind of happened. He'd said something into the mic and just threw it down and walked off stage. Axel didn't want to be outdone. And that's when all hell broke loose. The kids start freaking turn over cop cars, fighting the police, burning everything inside. People just storming into the grandstands and destroying everything. Some cars were on fire, there were people hurt, and we couldn't leave. I go and light myself on fire, 
and he upstages me. <laughs> and so we went into the dressing room, you know, and they're acting like nothing happened. Axel's down there with the cigarette holder in one hand and the champagne glass in the other. So my voice is giving me trouble. <laughs> Your voice is giving me trouble. You shouldn't probably be drinking or smoking. And it reminded me of the, of what it must have looked like when Rome burned and, and Nero played a fiddle. We can relate to Axel and his attitude, you know. So we learned we learned quite a bit on what not to do. <laughs> Released from the hospital the day after the Montreal riot, Hetfield began a painful ritual of 90-minute therapy sessions. Weeks would pass before he could make a fist, let alone play guitar. This is not going to bring us down, you know. This is going to take a lot more than that to stop Metallica. We got a friend out to, to fill in. It's like, you know, I can still sing. At the time, it was like he wasn't sure that he was going to ever play again. So John Marshall has is, is been our savior quite a few times. So it pays, you know, if you're a roadie, learn the band's songs. <laughs> you could end up on stage with them. He was very, very, very motivated to heal himself as quickly as possible. And James is the kind of guy who doesn't like letting people down. But we've asked a lot from James Hetfield as a band, as people, and he's delivered every time. It was always, I'm going to play. This is my life, and I don't care what happens. I'm going to continue. When you have a record that won't go away, it gives you the opportunity to keep touring on it. Basically turned into a challenge for us, another challenge. Hell, Metallica, we'll tour two years. Screw it. We got the endurance. Metallica toured relentlessly for the next two and a half years, playing more than 300 dates worldwide. Obviously, they're known for touring and touring and touring and touring. And touring. But in, in this kind of music, they, they proved to be the ultimate road dogs. Since day one, that's how we got our fan base. We got to love playing live. And touring was our thing. Hey, 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 hey. The band stopped in Moscow to perform for a crowd of over a half million Russian rock and roll fans. Russian boys running up, hugging you, going, we love Metallica, you know. We've been waiting our whole lives, and the energy that we got from them was just so amazing. But in the turbulent wake of perestroika, the enthusiasm of the crowd clashed with the Russian military authorities. Violence erupted. It's all military, beating kids down, just whacking them. They don't know, they don't understand what a release is at a show. They don't know what's going on here. During the show, the band was unaware of the mayhem. When the music stopped, Metallica was shocked to learn about the brutality that raged while they played. I believe there was like 200 rapes, 11 deaths, uh, people just beaten to a pulp. In the spring of 1992, a summer tour was planned, featuring Metallica with Guns N' Roses. We wanted to get the two biggest bands together on one bill and do a stadium tour across America. I'd always had an infatuation with Guns N' Roses. Always had an infatuation with bands that are unpredictable and dangerous. We learned a lot that summer. We learned what not to do as a rock band. The tour was plagued with cancellations and last-minute changes due to the recurring throat problems of Guns N' Roses singer Axl Rose. Then on August 8, 1992, the two bands were performing at Montreal's Olympic Stadium when a double dose of disaster struck. During Fade to Black, I'm up there playing the part and these colored flames are going off. I'm a little confused on where I should be. I walk forward, I walk back. We have these flashes of magnesium that burns at 1,200 degrees, 1,800 degrees, who knows, but hot enough to melt metal. The pyro guy doesn't see me that I've walked back out there. A big colored flame goes right up under me. Uh, and instantly I, you know, squint and turn. James Hetfield looks like uh, that torch that they carry up the stairs to light the Olympic fire. So I'm burnt, all my arm, my hand completely down to the bone, the side of my face, hair gone, uh, part of my back. 
I said, you all right, man? He looked at me and he, he was shaking and he brought up his, his hand. I could literally see the skin rising off his, his hand and blister. We see some guy come up and dump him with water and then cover him. Well, that felt oh, great for a second. Then I looked down and watched the skin just rising and things going wrong. Total confusion and adding to the mix, you know, 50,000 people. This is in Montreal. French speaking everywhere. Uh, we're trying to explain what's going on. Can we get to a hospital, please? A hospital, yes. And his skin is bubbling like on the Toxic Avenger. They're calling, you know, for an ambulance. And, you know, the security guys are kind of walking around. And the one guy bumps into, bumps into my hand, I remember. And I just lost it. I screamed. I punched him right in the nuts. <laughs> and I'm going, oh, my God, it's over. Oh, my God, our band is done. Lars took the stage to calm the disturbed and agitated crowd. There was an incident with uh, the pyrotechnics. Unfortunately, James uh, is on his way to the hospital right now, and we're, we're sorry, but we can't continue the concert for you guys tonight. This is pain I've never felt in my whole life. This, and it won't go away. I'm freaking at this point, you know. Anxiety, you know. Uh, we got to get moving. We got him into a ER. The doctors and nurses, they were great. They, they, they cut off his rings, his fingers were swelling. It was not a pretty sight. Because with the pain he was still going through and the unknown future that this was pointing the way to, one of his first thoughts was getting the replacement guitar guy to make sure the tour didn't have to stop. James had sustained second and third degree burns to his left hand and both arms. He had stepped into a 12-foot high, 3,200-degree tower of flame and survived. His future with the band was uncertain at best. Meanwhile, back at Olympic Stadium, a tense crowd waited for Guns N' Roses to perform. Guns N' Roses could have come out and saved the day by going on and playing a three-hour blistering set. That didn't happen. He took his whole band off stage, and that's when all hell broke loose. On August 8, 1992, James Hetfield sustained severe burns after stepping into a tower of flame at Olympic Stadium in Montreal. Hours later, concert headliner Guns N' Roses took the stage with singer Axl Rose. He could have been the hero of the day, you know. We continue the show and, you know, the band plays on and we're here to bring music and he throws this fit. Axel's monitor system wasn't to his liking. Then storm two of the evening kind of happened. He'd said something into the mic and just threw it down and walked off stage. Axel didn't want to be outdone. And that's when all hell broke loose. So the kids start freaking. Turn over cop cars, fighting the police, burning everything inside. People just storming into the grandstands and destroying everything. Some cars were on fire, there were people hurt, and we couldn't leave. I go and light myself on fire, and he upstages me. <laughs> and so we went into the dressing room, you know, and they're acting like nothing happened. Axel's down there with the cigarette holder in one hand and the champagne glass in the other. So my voice is giving me trouble. <laughs> Your voice is giving me trouble. You shouldn't probably be drinking or smoking. And it reminded me of, the, of what it must have looked like when Rome burned and, and Nero played a fiddle. We can relate to Axel and his attitude, you know. So we learned, we learned quite a bit on what not to do. <laughs> Isn't it funny how history has almost erased Guns N' Roses? One of the great frontmen in the past 20 years disappeared, yet Metallica continues to play anywhere in the world in front of any mass of people. Comes out with a new record which will always go platinum. They are the Led Zeppelin of this generation. Released from the hospital the day after the Montreal riot, Hetfield began a painful ritual of 90-minute therapy sessions. Weeks would pass before he could make a fist, let alone play guitar. This is not going to bring us down, you know. This is going to take a lot more than that to stop Metallica. We got a friend out to, to fill in. It's like, you know, I can still sing. At the time, it was like he wasn't sure that he was going to ever play again. So John Marshall is is they've been our savior quite a few times. So it pays, you know, if you're a roadie, learn the band's songs. <laughs> you could end up on stage with them. He was very, very, very motivated to heal himself as quickly as possible. And James is the kind of guy who doesn't like letting people down. Sure, we've asked a lot from James Hetfield as a band, as people, and he's delivered every time. 
It was always, I'm going to play. This is my life, and I don't care what happens. I'm going to continue. After two and a half years of non-stop touring, in the summer of 1994, Metallica agreed to take a long overdue open-ended break. Kirk studied film and Asian arts at San Francisco State. Lars pursued scuba diving and immersed himself in the art scene. Jason created new music projects and James pursued his own hobbies. Safer hobbies like hunting and now I got a motorcycle, hot rods and you know, wakeboarding, snowboarding. Plenty of uh, outdoor danger. I love it. Live for it. When they reunited a year later in late 1995, they were stronger than before. In the studio, there was a sense of revitalization and a new spirit of collaboration. There was a total sense of respect and a total sense of being at ease with what the other person was bringing into it. After three years in production and despite the near disintegration of the band, St. Anger is finally released in June 2003. Although it debuts at number one in America and the title track wins a Grammy, the album received harsh criticism. Overthought, overthought, beyond belief. The album contained no guitar solos from Kirk Hammett. I may be in the minority, but I like St. Anger a lot. You know, it's all riff. The band got down to the process of promoting the album. They found the perfect location for the St. Anger music video, San Quentin Prison. It fit in perfect with my vision of the song and the lyrics. Anger just come out sideways, you know, the wrong way instead of the healthy way. Both James Hetfield and Metallica had teetered on the edge of their own personal precipice, and they were now ready to return to the safety of the stage. The next two years saw Metallica doing what they love best, playing live on tour. The band spent the two years of touring and a year break, writing songs for a new album. Then another shock for Metallica fans. In 2006, Metallica announced that after 15 years in the chair, Bob Rock would not be producing their next album. In step legendary producer, Rick Rubin. Rick Rubin and us trying to capture the essence, the simplicity, the skeleton of Metallica. I think one of his key things that he wanted to try and do was to get Metallica to sound really live in the studio. He also had a long history with Thrash, you know, as a Slayer producer. I mean, just like as the man who basically codified what speed and thrash metal sounded like in the studio. Death Magnetic was released in 2008 to an ecstatic reception, opening at number one in many countries around the world. Metallica became the first band in history to have five consecutive albums debut at number one on the Billboard chart. Death Magnetic has some of their best writing. It has some of James's most intense and revealing lyrics. It's a great old school sounding Metallica metal album. Totally uncompromising. The return of Kirk Hammett playing solos is a huge triumph. Apocalypse, broke, beaten, and scarred. On top of all that is some of the best riffs they've ever written. The performances are fantastic. You know, just throw away the rules and don't give a damn what anybody else thinks. Broken, beaten, scarred is just huge, and it works so well. Like you don't just applaud the music; you applaud what they've been through and the fact that they have been able to resurrect what made them so great in the first place. The world goes away when we play. There can be no bad. Today, after nearly three decades together, Metallica shows no signs of slowing down. With Death Magnetic, they had reestablished themselves as the greatest force in heavy metal. And the rock and roll establishment finally agreed to. It is my sincere honor to induct you all into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. 
You know what? Remember one thing. This is really all about you people up on the balcony. Just remember that. In recognition of his enormous contribution to the success of the band, Metallica included Jason Newstead in the induction ceremony. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share the experiences of these amazing, bountiful decades of heavy metal ambassadorship. I want to thank Lars for calling me so we can include each other in our dreams of being in the greatest heavy metal band in the world. Thank you. Metallica had smashed open the doors to a hall of fame, previously locked to a legion of heavy rock bands. Their journey ahead is sure to take them from ambassadors to kings. Their power and influence reign supreme. Long may it continue.